Hey Tigers, coming to you live here uh, at Omaha Beach uh, in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, on vacation, but you know, it's kind of hard to see the ocean from here. In any case, I thought I'd better respond to some of your questions. Uh, I really am pleased with what you've sent me, uh, and lots of colorful uh, PowerPoint slides and everything. Uh, most of your questions had to do with the relationship of women uh, to the church or women uh, to uh, singing and in society and their particular role. And I'd like to address a few of your questions in this uh, first uh, video to you. I might try to get back to you tomorrow night and uh, answer a few more of your questions, particularly uh, dealing with my show and some of the other women composers. But uh, first I'd like to uh, uh, just uh, say a few things to Doug, uh, who wanted to know about the castrati. And uh, he wanted to know if uh, uh, they uh, used castratos back in the early uh, Greek and Roman times. And I suspect that they did, particularly if uh, you were involved with help helping the emperor's wife or something like that. Uh, they wouldn't want to have some guy running around uh, uh, who might kind of try to hit on the queen. So uh, many of the people that were put in charge of, of dealing with women if you had large groups of women, such as harems, uh, these men were normally castrated. Uh, the idea of, of having uh, castrated boys singing in church really emerges uh, during the Renaissance period, uh, in the middle of the 1500s. And I will address this issue a little bit more when we talk about the Renaissance period. Uh, it had to do with competition uh, with some ladies that were very beautiful singers, beautiful voices, and of course uh, uh, women were not allowed to sing in the Roman Catholic Church. And that comes to another question. Why uh, weren't women allowed to participate much in the church? And I guess we can sort of point the finger to St. Paul in one of his uh, letters to, in one of the epistles, I can't uh, quite tell you which one, but he uh, says that women should be and remain quiet during the church. Uh, sounds rather misogynistic, but then again, his culture was highly uh, patriarchal, where women simply uh, took a back seat in almost every activity, except uh, keeping the home in some kind of order. Uh, church was looked upon as serious business, and only the men uh, were allowed to, uh, to be involved in that respect. Now bear in mind that the attitude toward women was not a very good one. Uh, there is a Hasidic Jewish prayer which sort of translates uh, to the effect that says, uh, Lord, Lord, thank you. Thank you for not making me a woman. Now put that in context and you can begin to understand that uh, it was simply a projection of the attitude toward women and men's supposed superiority that prevented them from participating. Uh, Angelicia wanted to know why Gregorian chant is so simple. Well, the uh, music uh, of chant uh, really uh, grew out of some old Greek tunes, some old Jewish tunes uh, that were around before and during the time of Christ, and these were simply reworked and uh, became part of the liturgy. Now, you know one thing in particular, and that's the fact that institutions don't like to change. And part of the simplicity that we hear, certainly in monophonic texture, has to do with the fact that it is monophonic. Now, if you were to spend a lot of time getting to know a lot of different Gregorian chants, you would find them to be quite different from each other. Again, it's a matter of familiarity, because they would be appearing in different kinds of modes, old church modes. The Dorian mode sounds, sounds different from the Lydian mode, which sounds different from the Aeolian mode, and the Mixolydian mode, and so forth. So there are some subtle differences, uh, which may underlie and perhaps uh, cover over, uh, be covered over by the textual simplicity. Uh, but then again, this music was supposed to be kept apart from the secular world, the world of dancing, the world of, of joy 
and, and earthly pleasures. And the Roman Catholic Church uh, employed Gregorian chant up until 1962 with the so-called Second Vatican Council. Ever since then, uh, more secular music has, uh, kinds of music have part, been part taken in, in the church services. Uh, Cassandra wanted to know why the clergy did not write secular music. Well, uh, these boys were kept pretty busy thinking and reflecting upon getting to heaven. And the only thing that really mattered to, to the clergy, by and large, was just making sure that they could uh, enter into the pearly gates after their, their uh, physical life was over. Uh, remember, the idea of progress did, did not exist as an idea in our culture back then. People didn't put their names at the ends of their compositions. They didn't think in terms of posterity. The main thing was just trying to somehow eke out a livage, living, manage to survive, and the average survival age back in those days was somewhere in the 30s to around 40. People did not live to the ripe old age of 80, 90, or 100 that we do today. So they pretty much focused on religious things, and it didn't participate uh, to writing music uh, of a secular nature. Now, Shania wanted to know about Machaut, uh, his music for the Knights, and why he wrote uh, these songs. Well, by the time that Machaut was living, and he was living uh, throughout most of the uh, 14th century, the 1300s, this poetry associated with uh, chivalry and the art of courtly love was pretty much a common thing. It was almost a tradition. And he simply bought into the tradition and uh, wrote poems according to various kinds of poetic schemes. Uh, many of these poetic schemes were provided to us by the troubadours who had gotten them from the Turks. Uh, remember that the Moors were in uh, Spain, in northern Spain, and the troubadours were associated with southern France. And there was a kind of intercourse that went on between uh, these two cultures, and we were able, well, us Western European-rooted uh, people, were able to uh, use and borrow uh, their poetic uh, structures. But uh, uh, it was also important uh, to try to attempt to reinforce some kind of uh, civility in people, and the Roman Catholic Church uh, took it upon itself as being the people that were going to try to civilize and socialize humans, and uh, this poetry was all part of that, uh, the mainstream, if you will. Take a look at the 14th century. It was not a very wonderful time to live. Uh, you have uh, parents who are having children and in order to have a couple of kids live into adulthood, you may have to bear seven, eight, nine children. Most of them would die in infancy. They didn't have any knowledge of what a communicable disease was. They had no medicine. Uh, some would uh, be stillborn. Um, uh, some would die along with their mother in childbirth. So most parents didn't become too attached to the children that they were giving birth to because they didn't expect him to live very long, and why you know, invest a lot of emotional uh, interest in your children? Well, children who are neglected uh, emotionally end up growing uh, up in a very dysfunctional way. They tend to harbor a lot of anger, resentment. They have difficulty creating attachments with others in their lives. And so it was a very violent age. And in order to harness this energy, this hostility, it was uh, structured according to tournaments. And uh, these were designed through the efforts of the Roman Catholic Church and the kings and the hierarchy, uh, the knights and so forth, as ways of sort of diffusing a lot of anger and tension. Now, uh, civilization was generally brutal, and chivalry was attempt, an attempt to, to uh, sort of soften these harsh edges. Uh, there was a rejection of the Roman Catholic Church. We had two popes, one in Rome, one in Avignon, and the Pope in Avignon uh, was a big spendthrift. Uh, it was a very cor 